of different initiatives taking place now to understand how you can plant different crops underneath and between the panel rows and, and how they're affected by shade. There's microclimates every few feet underneath the panels. But my particular forte is, is sheep, sheep grazing. I love raising sheep. So we have a business called Solar Shepherd LLC, and we work with the asset owners of these large solar arrays that you're seeing all around the country. We were uh, founded in 2018, and uh, we raise sheep, we graze sheep, and we consult on sheep, sheep grazing. I'm from an agricultural family, and uh, I spent 20 years in financial services while maintaining our farm. We raised sheep, ducks, and chickens. It's actually the financial services experience that led me to creating Solar Shepherd. I, um, you know, over the course of my career, I worked distributing mutual funds. And the interest in the mutual fund products over time has, has shifted. Once upon a time, there were socially responsible investments. And the conversation was about how much return do you have to give up to, to invest according to your values? That conversation has changed over time to a, a widespread belief that investing according to your values and investing in a way that takes into account the environmental, social, and ethical impacts of a company, ESG investing, environmental, social, and governance, uh, presents the, the possibility to get greater returns. So as a mutual fund distribution person, I, I had roles in sales and marketing and, and data analytics, marketing strategy. I, I found myself working more and more with the money managers who were managing ESG mutual funds. And I was really struck by their, their vigor and their enthusiasm and their, their belief that the way they could have the, the best impact on the world, the best impact on the environment was through money management. And, uh, and developing these financial products. Working with them, it, it got me to think about what I care about and what's important to me. And I care about agriculture. I care about local agriculture and small farms. I, I care about clean energy. And uh, I, I care about maintaining that, that pastoral beauty in Massachusetts. And it got me thinking about how I could do that, how I could help. I had reached a point where I could take a step back in my career and, and try something new. So as I was working on putting this together and thinking about how I could have an impact and working with my sheep, there's a, um, a local conservation property, which used to be a sheep farm uh, years back. And it's a nice place to take a walk. There are beautiful pathways and, and uh, a nice little valley. And uh, it's, as a shepherd, it's, it's a, a wonderful place to walk and daydream about what it must have been like to raise sheep there. There's a natural barrier all the way around it. You don't need any fencing. There's a ridge that surrounds it. There's a beautiful green valley with a crystal clear stream and a still pool running through the middle of it. And it's a, it's a wonderful place to take a walk at lunchtime and, and think about what it must have been like to raise sheep there. So I was walking along and I walked out the back of the property, which abuts a college nearby and uh, came upon a, a great big solar array, which had been recently installed on what was the lambing pasture for this sheep farm. So the lambing pasture is your, your best, most nutritious grass, um, right up against the barn where you can bring your ewes in. And uh, as I was looking at the, the solar array, I thought, well, it's, uh, we need clean energy. It's a nice looking array. It's, um, it's too bad the sheep are gone. And as I was there, the landscaper came and, and started mowing the grass. And I thought, it makes no sense. You could just pick the sheep up, put the solar panels down, put the sheep right back down again. And I was thinking about that and thinking about how that might, might be a business and if I could communicate that to people. And as I was thinking about that, I walked up to the front of that property where they have a little display of Jacob sheep. Jacob sheep are kind of cool. They're a unique sheep that seems to have horns sticking out in every direction. So I stopped to look at the Jacob sheep. And while I was standing there, there was a, a little girl and a little boy, probably brother and sister at the rail looking at the sheep. And uh, maybe maybe six and four, something like that, young. And the uh, little girl turned to her brother and said, baby sheep are called lambs. Lambs cut the grass. That's why the guys who cut the grass are called lambscapers. And I thought, that's it. If, if this girl gets it without me even talking to her, I can, I can build this business, I can sell this product. And I ran home and, and it launched from there. 
Uh, so we maintain the vegetation around the solar arrays. We're innovative and green and we're cost effective. And I think we're easy on the eyes. That's, um, that's Juno that you see on that slide. He's a, um, a very sweet little limb. We also have a, I have a partner involved in this, Reggie, Reggie Finnegan. Um, so Ms. Regina Finnegan is our Executive Vice President of Operations. She's our Director of Livestock Management. She knows more about sheep than anyone I've ever met. She's our best employee. She's enthusiastic. She's happy. She's always ready to go first thing in the morning, right till the end of the day. She's indispensable in running this business. A little more about Reggie. This is her. She loves solar. She loves ducks. She loves treats. She likes a good nap every now and then and riding in pickup trucks, taking hikes. She loves the ocean. She doesn't really love baths, uh, but her favorite thing on earth is sheep. You can see her checking out some of this year's lambs. Has um, she been with sheep her whole life? She is, yes. That's, that's her purpose. She, she's a working border collie from uh, Scottish Working Lines and uh, very well trained. She's an excellent dog and, uh, and truly knows more about sheep than anyone I've ever met. If you, um, if you ask her to do something and she gives you a sideways glance, you're probably wrong. And she's given you a chance to correct yourself. <laughs> she's a very sweet dog. She's, uh, she's sitting here listening intently. Um, so Reggie helps us moving the sheep, rounding up the sheep, loading the trailer, um, unloading the trailer moving the sheep between paddocks and uh, couldn't do the job without her. So when we launched the business, we took a look at how things are maintained today on solar arrays, on the existing solar arrays. And typically it's mowing and string trimming. And uh, now the grass under these arrays is important. It's actually part of the PV system, of the, the solar system. That grass absorbs moisture. Well, first off, it, it stabilizes the ground. When you're building a, a solar site like this, you're building this asset, sending it out in a field and expecting it to last 25, 30, 40 years even. And um, erosion is a big concern. So that's part of why you see the grass planted there. Um, another reason behind that is that grass retains moisture and uh, the evening dew settles on that grass. In the daytime, that moisture evaporates and creates a rising column of air that actually cools the solar panels and helps them generate more power. So the grass is an important thing to have there, but you need to maintain it where it grows into the back of your panels, it grows into the equipment, uh, could create a fire hazard in the worst case scenario, which is very rare. Um, but the typical way of maintaining that's with mowing and string trimming. It leaves dust and debris on the panels, which actually creates a measurable drop in generation. Um, it, it pastes the equipment with, with the debris that you see in that right-hand photo. And uh, in the worst case scenarios, you can kick up a rock. And, uh, and just yesterday, I was, I was looking at a site that we may take on this year, and there were about 25 or 30 broken panels where they were, they were broken by a rock that came from a lawnmower and skipped across the panels. That's so interesting. I never knew why solar panels were always in an open field. Yeah. Yeah, that, that helps cool those panels and generate more power. Another method of maintaining these solar arrays is with the use of herbicides. And uh, personally, that's um, something I'd like to remove. It's, um, it's fading now, but it's, it's still in use. It's difficult for a mower to get underneath those panels. So some solutions that you see is a mower with a sprayer on the back. And they mow between the panel rows and spray underneath them with Roundup. Um, it's not good for the environment. It's not good for the water. It's, um, it's just simply not wholesome. And I don't think it's a good look for solar. You can see the drip lines here. You can see the, the dead vegetation. And that grass that grows under the panels is what's retaining the most moisture and doing the most at cooling those panels. So killing that grass isn't doing anyone any favors either. So we believe we deliver a unique value here. We uh, eliminate downtime caused by vegetation management, no, no rock strikes, no tractor hitting a, a panel. We're a greener solution. There's no herbicides, there's no noise, there's no need for additional chemicals, no need for additional fertilizers. Uh, we're aesthetically pleasing. I, I think our sheep are beautiful. 
it makes me happy to watch sheep graze and, and it appears to make all the neighbors of these solar arrays happy as well. Um, frequently, when we go to check the sheep, find folks lined up at the fence, talking to the sheep, looking at the sheep, showing the children. It's a nice way to engage with the community. So why sheep? Well, the sheep eat the vegetation that grows on these solar sites. They eat vegetation down to about two inches above the ground. They're allergic to copper, so they're not going to mess with any of the wiring. They're, um, you know, when you when you see a sheep that's had a full full meal, the favorite thing to do is find a shady spot and and lay down. And they go underneath the panels, lay down, relax in the shade, and they eat that vegetation that's under the panels. That's so difficult for a traditional landscaper to get at. Uh, they really require only the grass and water. There's no significant agricultural uh, equipment on site. No tractors running through the field. You said uh, sheep are allergic to copper, but are any other animals allergic to copper, like cows? They're not. Actually, if you have cows or goats or any other animals on your property with sheep, you need to buy a specific kind of food formulated just for sheep because the copper that's in the food for goats and for cows and horses is enough to, to harm a sheep. So, you know, if you, were, if you were getting into this and you had a flock of goats in your backyard, you wanted to add some sheep, you'd want to switch from, from a regular feed to, uh, from a regular sweet feed to an all stock sweet feed. Um, that's, that's important. The sheep are, are delicate with the copper. They're very delicate around the panels. They're, they're a gentle animal. They're um, pleasant to work with. They're, they're not rough. We don't have stampeding issues. Um, there's nothing like that. They're, they're a, very, a very soft, gentle animal. So water is one of the big inputs here. And you can see we got a water system, some sheep drinking from it. We wanna make sure that they have clean, fresh water at all times. It can be warm on these solar sites. We shear right at the start of the season to make sure there's no extra wool on the animals but they, they love the solar sites. From a sheep's perspective, it's a wide open pasture that happens to have shade every 20 feet or so. so. That's our water system delivering some water. We use Electronet fencing inside to keep the sheep where we want them. It uh, has a mild charge um, powered by a solar panel and uh, it, it keeps the sheep where we want them in the array. We use a rotational grazing strategy, which, which has a bunch of environmental benefits on its own, but it allows us to maintain this vegetation effectively. And what I mean by that is essentially we close off a small portion of a solar array, we put the sheep in there. Um, experience grazing has taught us how long they need to be there. They eat that down, we move them to the next part of the, of the solar array. We move back and forth across the array and uh, we use this electro net to keep the sheep where we want them and to keep them safe. It's, um, it's very, you know, we love our animals and uh, it's important that, that we keep them safe and comfortable. They gain weight faster when they're happy, um, but keeping them protected with that electro net is important to us. How many sheep graze at a time or how many do you have? <laughs> It depends on a bunch of factors. So we have a, a large number of sheep, which is um, growing by the minute. We're, we're finishing up lambing season now. And I, I just came in from checking on a ewe who is um, in the early stages of labor. So perhaps by the end of this call, we may have more sheep than when we started. Um, wow. But the, the how many sheep per site is an interesting question. There's, there's a bunch of business decisions to be made there and, and carrying capacity decisions. So across our part of the country, if you think about a, um, a band from, you know, Pennsylvania up to um, middle of New Hampshire and, uh, and moving that band most of the way across the country until you get to the other side of the Rockies where the geography is very different. Uh, an acre of land can essentially typically support two and a half used and her lambs. Uh, so if you want for some sites, um, sites that it makes sense geographically and it makes sense given the forage and, uh, and the location of the array, we will balance that flock to fit the land. The sheep will go out there in May and they'll stay until about the 1st of October and we'll move them back and forth across the site. 
for other sites that are farther away, we're, you know, we have this, this goal of, of being a green business and, and having a positive impact on the environment. There is a trucking aspect to this, moving the animals back and forth. So for some sites, there's a, there's a tipping point where it makes more sense to bring in 50 animals, eat this entire array in a few days and move to the next site. Um, so we, we balance this site that you're looking at these pictures, we had 15 sheep on six acres and uh, they stayed there through the whole season, loved it and uh, finished the array up about the second week of October and, uh, and then headed home. They were happy to get there, happy to check the place out, happy to eat the whole thing. And when I pulled up with the truck and trailer, they lined up at the back gate and climbed right in. Um, didn't need Reggie for that one. Um, so these are Suffolk sheep, by the way. Um, that's our primary flock. They're, um, they're a wonderful animal. Produce wool and, and quality meat. Where do the, uh, where do the sheep sleep? The sheep sleep under the panels. Funny you ask. Shelter is the other input for the sheep. The solar panels themselves look very much like the USDA plans for sheep shelter, for open pasture sheep shelter. And the sheep love it. They go underneath the panels. They, you know, they're, they're wearing wool. They're, they're very comfortable most of the summer. Um, they enjoy the shade under the panels. If there is a, a significant weather event, we'll pull the sheep home. But we haven't had to do that in the, in the few seasons we've been grazing here on solar. We've, uh, we've been lucky with the weather. The, uh, the sheep use those panels as their shelter. They like it. Yeah, they look very happy. They're so Yeah, cute. They're, they're happy animals. This one is um, the one in the middle here. You can't see my cursor, I imagine. The, the one in the middle is um, she lost her ear tag. And when they lose an ear tag, they get a name. So she's Brownie. She's named after my childhood beagle. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brownie loves snuggles. So that is a shot looking down of Brownie putting her chin on my belly looking for rubs. They're, uh, they're a very friendly animal. <laughs> so they don't, they don't all have names? I'm sorry? Do they all have names or no? They, they all end up with names. It's easiest during lambing to tag. There are legal requirements. Your, your livestock should be tagged in the first 18 months. Um, Okay. The tags that they wear have two identification numbers on them, actually three identification numbers in total. One identifies my farm, one identifies the flock within my farm, and then one identifies the individual animal. And uh, it allows you to keep great records. We have a, an app on the iPhone called Herd Boss, and uh, we load all our records in there. So when they're, when they're young lamb and they're moving so quickly and bouncing all over the place, it's a lot easier to know them by number. As they get older, they, they're individuals and, and you can recognize each individual by their face, by their voice. They all have different voices. And, uh, and that's when they start getting a name. You know, we've got Brownie and Molly and, and Cinnamon and a whole bunch of them. Um, one year we named all of our ewe lambs after villages in Hawaii and all of our ram lambs after villages in Alaska. It's, um, it just worked out. So we had Juno and Kenai and Talkeetna and we had Kailua and Wailua and uh, Haleiva. Haleiva is Brownie's daughter and, um, and probably, probably my current favorite. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> This is a glimpse of the results they produce. You can see the electric fence here in this picture on the right. You can see they've grazed the area on the left. They haven't grazed the area on the right yet. Um, but properly managed, they do just as good a job as a lawnmower, if not better. Another picture of some results. One of the great uses of the sheep is when you have a site that's rocky or ledgy or steep or the panels are set um, across the fall line so you can't run a tractor between the rows. Sheep do a great job. They're, they're great on that, that rocky soil. It's nice if, if, from a farmer's perspective, if it's a steep rocky site, that's nice for me because the sheep get more exercise. It's good for them. They walk up and down the hill. We'll put the water at the bottom of the hill and uh, perhaps some supplemental mineral at the top of the hill 
And that's enough to keep them walking back and forth all day long, getting their vitamins and getting their water. That's for sure better than a lawnmower trying to do that trek as well. Exactly, exactly. You couldn't come in here with a lawnmower. This, this area of this site would have been all string trimming. Another thing that I feel we bring to the table is a, a sense of stewardship. We're, there, we're used to looking at land differently. Farmers are used to looking at land differently than I think um, landscapers are. And we bring a level of stewardship based in part on the time that we spend there managing the animals. We can look around and see things. So on this site in particular, we found a, a gigantic beehive on the back of a solar panel. And uh, that's not, not great for power generation, not great for the solar panel, not great for the solar tax, and uh, not wonderful for me either the way I found it. But we were able to take a snapshot of that and take a screenshot from our phone showing exactly where that beehive is and send that right off to the solar operator who can send somebody out and, uh, and take care of that. So we've found you know, different things. There, there was a lightning strike on a panel once. We were able to pass that along and tell them where it was. Um, you know, if there's ever any damage to the fence, anything like that. And, uh, you know, that, that last picture on the right, that's a little baby snapping turtle that's migrating through. In Massachusetts, when we build our solar arrays, we set our fence about six inches off the ground, the perimeter fence, so that it doesn't impede wildlife. And that's important so that these turtles and, uh, and other creatures can, can pass through, can make their way from point A to point B without the array being in their way. I always wondered, you know, we're doing this all over the place. How often is a turtle really trying to get across this array? And uh, sure enough, I came upon a flock of baby snappers commuting through. Now, the, the sheep won't bother that turtle at all. I think a lawnmower might behave a little differently. And what's your relationship with the company that built the solar array? Like you said, you send someone out from their company to take care of the hives and things? Yes. The solar company maintains the array. We do just the vegetation work. That's, that's all we do, not the remote monitoring or, or anything like that. So when you build these arrays, uh, most of these operators have a big remote monitoring center. And they're connected to the arrays and, and are, they're measuring the power generation. They're looking for issues. But if you see a drop in power generation or a string, one, one row of panels starts to get hot, you don't really have an answer as to what's causing that until you send somebody out to check it. So this, I'm sure this panel wasn't generating the power it should be. And I'm sure it was reading as a little bit warm. Um, we could tell them why. So rather than sending a truck from the home office out to this site to see that it's a beehive, to run home to the main office and call a beekeeper to come in and, and get that out of there, uh, they knew what they were dealing with, where it was, and they could we could cut out one trip back and forth with the truck and, yeah. and send somebody in to take care of it. So the solar companies do all the wiring. Reggie and I don't do any electrical work. Uh, and how just, do you get paired with this with this specific solar array? This one in particular was built on a working cattle farm. And uh, this one was one of our first sites. We met with the solar developer who had built the site, no longer owned it. They introduced us to the current owner and uh, that owner talked to the landowner. So there's, there's multiple parties here, right? There's a construction company that builds the solar array. There's a, a solar operator that, that holds that array. And then there's a landowner. Um, that's, that's one thing we don't talk a lot about, but the, the solar operations and the, the development of these solar arrays in Massachusetts has done a, a tremendous amount to save family farms. It provides a you know, diversified, non-correlated stream of income that a farm can depend on. So this array, you don't see the rest of the farm in this Google shot in the middle here, but this was a, a section of the farm that hadn't, hadn't been farmed in 50 or 75 years of forest had grown up there. And, uh, you know, thinking about the multi-generational aspect of these farms, they thought, we're not going to get out there and start farming that land again for another 35, 40 years. We want to save it. We don't want to put a subdivision there. Um, we know that, you know, the, the landowner knows that perhaps their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren will be farming that piece of land. 
So they signed a lease and put this solar array there. That's a wonderful thing for, for the farms in Massachusetts and, and across the country. Yeah, that's super cool to hear all the subsystems that go within these systems. You don't even see the other half, but it's really cool to keep those farms alive. Yeah, it is. It is. So the cattle farm operator was was excited about the idea that we'd be grazing it with sheep. It's, um, you know, beef cattle would be the the wrong animal for, for this array. Although there are developers building arrays specifically suited to be grazed with horses or beef cattle now. Um, building them higher and, and a bit stronger that can take that, you know, rub of the animal and, and provide the, the overhead clearance that those animals need. That's uh, another developing area within agrivoltaics. Another thing that I think Solar Shepherd brings to the table. So when you think about why a solar operator would want to go with sheep grazing instead of a traditional vegetation management program, we found that you know, thankfully our customers are doing this because it's it's the right thing to do. They look at this and say, wow, you know, we can produce food, fiber, and energy all from the same acre of land. It's the right thing to do. It's better for the environment. And that's why they do it. But there are another set of byproduct benefits to that. There's great public relations exposure for that, print, video, and social media. People like the sheep. They're beautiful. Um, and then another piece of that is pulling in investment dollars to grow solar. We're all on this call because we believe we can have an impact on the environment. We can, we can make the world a better place. That's why we're all here. It's, it's important to our values. We're not alone in that. And uh, in that previous career in financial services, doing a lot of work on, on ESG, the environmental, social, and governance mutual funds, we ran a bunch of studies and we learned that you know, across the United States, 75% of people say they want their investments to reflect their personal values. They want to know their assets are doing social good. They want to invest in companies with good environmental records. The grazing operation and agrivoltaics as a whole is a way that a solar operator can demonstrate that to individual investors. They can show the people that are investing in their community solar developments that here's another way that we're doing that. Here's how we're, we're maximizing our usage of that land. We're supporting local agriculture and, uh, and reducing our, our carbon footprint while we do it. And it's not just the individual investors. When you are looking to fund a package like that, a product like this, a, a large solar array, big project, you're going off to institutional investors. And the institutional investors told us very much the same thing as the individual investors. 44% consider ESG factors to be as, as important as fundamental factors in investment analysis. So what that means is 44% of the largest money managers in the country, the, the largest pools of investment dollars, they believe that these environmental, social, and ethical governance factors are as important analyzing companies and investments as things like their balance sheet, like sales and assets cash flow. It's just as important. They, they play a role in these organizations' investment selections. These organizations are looking for things that, you know, they want to in, align their investment strategy with their values. They also want to minimize headline risk. And if you think back to that herbicide slide, can you, can you come up with some headline risks there? 59% said it's alpha to be found in ASG. And that's, uh, that's financial services jargon for return on investment. 59% say if you're investing in companies that have a positive environmental record, that are socially aware, that are ethically run, you're going to have a better return on your investment. So this is another reason beyond just it's right as to why an organization would want to incorporate agrivoltaics in their, in their ground mount solar array projects. And so you really used to be steeped in like this side of it. And this is what made you get really invested in it. But what does your day-to-day -day look like now? Like, could you walk us through a day in the life of, of Solar Shepherd? Oh, sure. Well, in the summertime, it's more fun <laughs> in some ways. In the summer, when we have the sheep out on solar, first thing in the morning, we load up the truck with water. We have a 
we track all this stuff, as you can see, I have a background data analysis. So I can predict when they need water and how much water they need um, with a, a tolerance on there. I never want them out of water. I, um, we measure the grass and the forage that's available to them and we time those, those moves of the fencing, trying to minimize as many trips in the truck as we possibly can. But first thing in the morning, we'll load up water, we'll load up some fencing, um, some supplemental minerals that we provide to make sure that the nutrition is right on for the sheep. And uh, Reggie and I hit the road. And uh, we'll go and we'll visit the sheep. The first thing you do is count your sheep, make sure they're all there, walk your fence lines and make sure all that's secure, top off the water while you're walking the fence line if you want to be efficient, and, um, and, and make sure everything's going well. If it's a day where there's a sheep move, what we'll do is set up our next paddock, they're called, the individual sections within the array. We'll set up a paddock with our electronet fencing, which is, it's a lot like a volleyball net at ground level. And um, set that up, we'll herd the sheep together and move them into the next pasture. Once we herd them, when they're on solar, once we round them all up and get them together, they're smart enough to know that the gate's gonna open and they're about to get fresh grass. So they're very cooperative and uh, we move them into the next paddock and they start chowing down. Um, and we'll move on to the next site. And that's, that's a bulk of the, the day to day in the summertime. In the winter time, and, uh, and I would include now here in Massachusetts, at the end of winter for us, that's, a, um, that's more traditional farming time. So the sheep are all home on the farm and we're feeding out hay we feed round bales. They're about uh, 800 to 1,000 pounds a piece. Those great big round, round bales you see out in pastures, you pick them up with the tractor, bring them in, feed them the sheep. Um, in the wintertime, they get supplemental grain to keep the nutrition up. The first thing that happens when they come home is we give them a few days to settle in and uh, we start increasing their, their plane of nutrition. We give them more grain with each, each passing day for a period of time. And then we introduce Cambridge. I don't have any pictures in this deck of Cambridge, but Cambridge is our Suffolk Ram. And uh, it's, it's dating time in the fall. And uh, so the Ram goes in and, and he does his job. He's um, again, a, a very happy animal, very happy to do his job. He uh, goes in and, and uh, takes care of the hard work. And then uh, we pull Cambridge out and then it's carefully monitoring the nutrition and, uh, and health the sheep for about five months through their pregnancy. And then we get to the other really exciting time of year, which is lambing. I love lambing, it's hard work, it's a 24 hour a day job, um, but it's, uh, it's a little bit like Christmas. Every time I walk down to the pen, you go down, you, you have to help some ewes out. Most of our sheep are, um, they're very healthy, they're good moms and, and they tend to deliver without assistance most of the time. Um, sometimes you need to get involved and, and help either, you know, similar to humans, you can have a breech birth, you can have those kinds of issues and, uh, and you help out with that, uh, deliver the lambs and then tagging and, and all the stuff that goes with managing the, managing the animals. We, um, we castrate most of our ram lambs so that they can go out on solar. Um, we do sell some off and, uh, and now we're at the stage where our, our lambs are, are getting ready to be old enough to be grazers this year. So most of them, we, we, we thought we'd be finished lambing at this point. I, I mentioned when we were getting ready for this call, uh, I have one ewe who I believe is likely in labor by now. Um, I ran in just, just before the call and uh, she's number 5060 and I believe she's having twins. So we'll, we'll deliver them and, uh, and then we'll raise these lambs up. When they get to be about eight weeks old, they can be weaned. Um, we, we sort of let, let the sheep wean themselves. Some folks will separate the lambs from the ewes. It's, um, it's a little traumatic and with our breed of sheep, we, we just haven't found that necessary. So we leave our lambs with the ewes and, uh, and raise them together. They'll wean at about eight weeks. We will shear um, probably the first week of May this year, looking at the weather, um, shear off all the wool, 
we um, we sell the wool, the hand spinners locally, and uh, and then the sheep will be ready to head back out to solar. And we is it is it just you that shaves all the all the land? I don't. <laughs> shearing oh, okay. shearing is a skilled profession in its own right, and uh, we work with a shearer. His name's Aaron Aaron Shearing. He's uh, based in Massachusetts. He shears up and down the East Coast, out to the Midwest. And uh, then in the off season, he goes to Australia, New Zealand and shears down there. I can shear a sheep, you know, I can shear a sheep a day. I'm gonna be sore, it's gonna take all day. Um, Aaron can shear probably um, 15 or 20 sheep in an hour. He'll do a better job. They'll have a much better haircut than if I do it. And, uh, and he's really, he's really fantastic. His name's Aaron Liu. He, uh, he's on Instagram. He's got some great sharing videos on Instagram. The sheep love him. He, uh, he's really gentle with the animals. The sheep are, are interesting. One of the, one of the interesting things about sheep and it makes shearing possible and a lot of other management things is, um, there's a, a term it's called throwing a sheep. But what you do is you, you take the sheep muzzle and turn it back towards the hip. And when you do, it places the sheep a little bit off balance and they gently roll onto their bum. Once they're in that position, sort of upright like this, they're kind of hypnotized and you can trim their hooves, you can shear them, you can do whatever you need to do. And then when you release the animal, they jump up happy and, and run away, but they'll sit completely still. That's how I, you know, the hooves need trimming a couple times a year um just like horses or so it's uh it's sort of like clipping toenails and uh with a 250 pound animal it's nice that they sit still when you tip them under their bum <laughs> that's really awesome uh we have a couple more questions from our q a in the chat here um david has a question that says any resources for agrivoltaics like other organizations or websites um, he says he's imagining a permaculture design where solar arrays do not exist in isolation. That is, util utilizes their shade, windbreaking, et cetera. Yes, yes. Um, well, I'm a, a member of an organization, a board member of the American Solar Grazing Association. That's one resource you could check out. That's uh, solargrazing.org. I'm not the only crazy sheep farmer out here eating solar arrays. We have a, a network of farmers across the country. So the American Solar Grazing Association is one source where you could learn a lot more about agrivoltaics, um, solargrazing.org. Um, another great source, University of Oregon has done a bunch of work on, on grazing and agrivoltaics. UMass Amherst has done work on that. There's a company in Germany, Fraunhofer, that is, uh, um, done quite a lot of work on that. There are arrays built in Germany 10 years ago or so that are being used to produce vegetables. And, uh, you know, David hit the nail on the head. There, there are a bunch of microclimates there from, from directly underneath the panels to as you approach the middle of the open laneway between the panels and then back under the edge of the next panel. And different crops grow better in, in each, you know, they sort of divide these rows up where you've got tomatoes in one row and then kale in the next. And uh, I'm a sheep farmer. I don't want to get out of my depth here. But uh, so there, there are a number of different ways to incorporate agrivoltaics. We're seeing that all around the world now. We get um, Solar Shepherd gets questions from folks in India and Bangladesh building arrays that way. And, uh, and we work with solar developers around the country today, helping them build the solar arrays specifically geared towards sheep management. There's a, a few minor tweaks. It's, it's, the grazing is taking off. And uh, with a few minor tweaks to how an array is built, you can graze it much more effectively. Um, a, big, a big piece being a well, if there's fresh water on site, clean fresh water, that allows us to reduce our, our trips out there and make this green operation even a little bit greener. Uh, there are fence considerations and, and ways you can adjust the installation of the fence and, and the roadways or the access points with really minimal investment that would um, facilitate use of that land for grazing as well as solar production. I think UMass Amherst 
staying local would be a, a great source to check out on that more agrivoltaic information. And um, my, my last slide here has some contact info on it. Um, if you, if you want to follow up with an email, I'd be happy to email with anyone who wants to talk about um, resources or other, other places you could learn more about this besides just the grazing animals. Yeah, uh, thanks. We normally try to wrap around 6.45 or 7.45, but uh, if anyone has any last questions, put them in the chat. Um, while, you're, while you're typing, I just wanted to ask, can people come visit your sheet? They can. Um, now, it's, it's important to remember that it's a, it's a high voltage power generation site that we're talking about when they're out on solar. But it's, it's funny you asked that. We had one solar array last season that we're hoping to get back again this year. I think we're going to out in the Berkshires that um, was planted with pollinator crops, which is actually, I didn't mention the pollinators. A lot of solar developers are, are planting these fields, not just with plain grass, but with pollinator crops. And uh, there's a, a company, Ernst Seed, which has produced a blend of crops that are, we call it fuzz and buzz is the seed mixture. And uh, it's specifically formulated to provide appropriate nutrition to sheep and bees. Uh, so you can, you can plant your solar array with pollinator crops, help the local bee population, hire a beekeeper and, and bring in a couple of hives, and then graze the whole thing with, with sheep. And then you're producing food and fiber and honey and, and beautiful flowers all in one spot. And, uh, and that provides a great service to the surrounding ecosystem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's been super cool to hear about all these ecosystems. And of course, we love hearing about solar and everything. So thank you so much. Uh, I think Thanks, we honestly yeah. answered all the questions that our, our people asked, but I hope they enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Thanks, I did too. I could talk about sheep all day long. <laughs> well, maybe you'll have another sheep tonight. I don't know. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I think she's having twins. I think she's having twins. What's we had a lot, of, a lot of twins and triplets this year. This one's still wearing an ear tag. She's oh. 506. -0. 506. -0. Uh, 506. -0. We're all pulling for her. Yeah. <laughs> she looks like she is ready to move to the next stage of motherhood more than anything. She's yeah. With <laughs> twins. Wow. She's a big girl. She's ready. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Have a good night. And we will send the recording to everyone who registered and we'll have a follow up with everyone who came tonight. So thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.